Okay, before we go any further, we want to discuss flint napping safety. Concerned with our eyes, our hands, and our lungs. And flint napping really is, is pretty safe compared to most other hobbies. But, uh, you know, the eyes are the main consideration, I think. You want to protect your eyes. You want to wear reading glasses like I do, or safety glasses, or goggles. Goggles sometimes fog up, so I prefer just plain old reading glasses. Uh, when you're flint napping, small flakes will fly up. They'll hit you in the face. Not a big deal, but if they get in your eyes, it's a problem. And I've had them in my eyes in the old days when I didn't wear glasses, and it's no fun at all. Next thing is small little cuts on your hands. I've never had a, a major cut that required stitches or anything like that, but I always have band-aids with me at all times. And uh, a lot of my napper friends don't carry them, so it's, it's good to pass these things around. You're going to get cut. Uh, it's pretty minor. You can wear uh, gloves if you want. The gloves, in my opinion, they interfere with doing a quality job on the piece that you're working. So I don't wear them and I don't recommend gloves. I recommend proper technique. If you're napping using proper technique, you're not going to get cut very seriously. Most of the cuts you'll be able to be really small, usually from your leg pad. And the last thing to consider is your lungs. Uh, there's a thing called silicosis. It's basically called, caused by silica dust. It'll get in your lungs and uh, it's similar to asbestos in some ways. It can create some lung problems. And uh, the flint nappers of uh, old days that were making the gunsmiths Quite frequently, they would die uh, in the early 30s of silicosis. They didn't know what it was back then, but it was, they knew it was related somehow to their occupation. We now know it's silicosis. They would get this because they were grinding gun flints on these huge grinding wheels. I've seen pictures of them. They look like they're six, eight foot in diameter. And they would have this flint right down next to their face, and the grinding wheel would be coming around like that, basically just uh, inundating them with silica dust. They would inhale this into their lungs, some particles would get in there and agitate the lungs, and they'd get sick. So in order to avoid that, nap outdoors, for one thing, I don't recommend that you nap indoors, I never do that. And always use a fan, have the fan blowing sideways, across. Uh, if it's too cold in the winter time, a few times I have worn a respirator. I find the respirator kind of bulky and uh, hard to deal with. But you know, I'd rather be safe than sorry. So uh, the best thing, I think, is just to use a fan and have it blowing gently across. It'll blow all that dust away from you, and you'll be breathing nice, fresh air. OK, the next thing is we want to define some of the terms used in flint napping. When you find a rock in the field, like these three right here, and you start working it, this is known as the core. From the time you start working it until you finish it, this is referred to as the core. Most of the time when nappers work a core down into something, they work it down into what's called a biface. It has two faces. This is also sometimes referred to as a preform. Now not all cultures made bifaces. Some cultures would specialize and they would make what is known as blade cores, like these right here. So they would turn something like this into something like this, which is called a blade. Now each blade core could produce several hundred razor sharp blades like these. These blades were the goal in the napping, not the core. The core was often discarded afterwards or sometimes used for something else. Now the difference between a flake and a blade is that the blade is usually twice as long as it is wide. Sometimes these flakes were utilized in making arrowheads. Sometimes flakes like this would be utilized just like it is for uh, butchering. Sometimes the edge would be retouched with a little bit of pressure flaking, and then it's referred to as a scraper. Okay, the next thing is a concept called center line. When you're working a core like this into a biface, you kind of want to visualize where your final biface is going to rest. So you have this imaginary center line in here, or center plane, and uh, that's a concept that nappers sometimes use. Large flakes like these are often referred to as spalls, and they're great blanks for making uh, small knives, large arrowheads. Now this hump right here is referred to as a bulb of percussion. The flake was struck right off of here. This little secondary flake scar right there, and here, and on here, that's called an aurelier. It's just a secondary scar that sometimes is associated with a hard hammer percussion. If you look at the, uh, the ripple marks on here, they always point back to where the actual flake 
was detached from the core, so it was struck right here, detached like that. Here's another example. You can see the ripples going out like that, kind of like waves on a pond. Now probably the most common term you're going to hear in flint napping is the word platform. You'll hear it over and over and over again. All platform refers to is the point of contact between the hammerstone or the billet, whichever you're using, in this case a hammerstone, and the point of contact on the core where you're actually removing a flake. So if I was to strike this like this and remove a flake on this core, this actual point of impact here would be referred to as the platform. Same thing would apply on this spall right here if I was to remove this bulb of percussion with this antler billet, the point of contact between the billet and the spall would be referred to as the platform. Now there's three different ways to remove flakes from a core. The first is called percussion where you actually strike the core with either a billet or a hammerstone or a copper bopper, whatever, but it's done directly. The next method is called pressure flicking, where you actually take your tool and you press flakes off the edge. In this case I'm using an antler, you might use a copper tip pressure flicker. Pressure flakes of course are much smaller than percussion flakes. Last method is called indirect percussion, it's when a punch either a straight punch or a notch punch is placed against the edge and then it's struck on the back with either a hammer stone or a billet to remove a flake. This is an example of indirect percussion. Punch is placed against the edge, the platform, and then it's struck to remove a flake like that. There's two different ways to support a core. The first is called freehand percussion where the piece is held freely in the hand away from the leg. Second way is directly on your leg. Most people will learn to nap like that. Freehand percussion gives you a little bit more control though. This outer layer of the rock that's exposed to the weather is called the cortex. It's always a lot softer than the, in the interior of the rock and so your first flake is always going to be less predictable. A good way to learn percussion flaking is just to take a hammer stone and to get the feel of it in your hands and just to take a raw piece of stone like this, in this case obsidian, works really easy for beginners and just to remove three or four flakes from one corner to make sort of a pebble tool. This gives you a feel for the tool in your hand as well as the core and from there you'll go on to making more and more refined pieces. On thinner pieces like this spall you might want to switch over to an antler billet and just practice getting rid of that square edge. So you just play around with it like that and kind of get the feel of the tools in your hand. And uh, as time goes by, after a couple of hundred pounds of uh, doing this, you'll get the hang of it. Now go ahead and practice up with your tools. And on the next segment, we're going to take a bottle and we're going to remove the bottom of the bottle and actually make an arrowhead out of it. But uh, first of all, I've got to drink this beer before we can get started.